We'll just wait a few seconds to let the room fill up. Okay, well, I'll get started here. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Mark Lee Wilson. I'm the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub lead with the Transition Accelerator. And the Accelerator is a pan-Canadian not-for-profit created to help Canada make a prosperous energy transition. We are a founding member of the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub, which is an alliance of municipal government and Indigenous leaders formed to accelerate the adoption of hydrogen in the region while leading the way in social, economic, and environmental performance. With me today is Kirk Hamilton with Seifer Technologies, and we're going to talk about uh, the work that we've been doing over the past year or so to discover challenges and barriers to developing a hydrogen economy and what approaches can be used to overcome them. Kirk, do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yes, my name is Kirk Hamilton. I'm a senior engineering advisor at Seifer Technologies here in Edmonton. <clears throat> and uh, been, had the privilege of working alongside Mark in this hydrogen space for the last year and a half, um, working again to sort of more on the technical side. And uh, today, again, I'll be talking on that again, identifying and over the, the specific challenges we're seeing that we need to address in order to be successful in this hydrogen uh, transition. Thanks, Kirk. So the format for today is I'll, I'll present some of our findings from the hub, looking mostly through a social and economic lens. And then uh, Kirk will talk about, like you said, some of the technical challenges that CIFR has uncovered, um, as well as give us a little bit of insight to the recently announced Clean Hydrogen Center of Excellence. Um, after that, we'll have some Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A section and upvote the ones that you want uh, addressed the most. And we also have the chat function enabled. So feel free to introduce yourselves to others, tell us where you're from, um, what your interest in hydrogen is. Um, but don't put questions in the chat um, for us because we won't be able to see them. Uh, the questions will need to go into the, the Q&A section. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, when we talk about hydrogen, the Edmonton region is unique to the world as we have existing hydrogen production and, and use at large scale over 2000 tons per day which is around 10 million gigajoules or so per month or the equivalent amount to be able to heat or power about a million homes or maybe a few million cars, two or three million, depending on how you do the math. It's a lot of energy being used, produced and consumed in the Edmonton region right now. And on top of that, we have large at scale carbon capture projects that have been operating for a number of years. So there's the know-how, the technology, the supply chain, and importantly, geological storage capacity for carbon dioxide, as well as pipeline infrastructure to transport the CO2 in the Edmonton region. So there's high potential in the region to leverage all of those strengths to deploy hydrogen adoption into other sectors. The sectors these sectors traditionally use other fuels such as natural gas, diesel, gasoline, even coal, which have established and long-standing value chains. But hydrogen is new for these sectors and the value chain needs to be built, which presents a number of challenges, as you may imagine. So we take a hub approach to these challenges, which is to say we're, we're doing our best to convene stakeholders along the value chain to understand and socialize the challenges amongst all the stakeholders. Um, this webinar is an example of us trying to get information out there to stakeholders. But the bottom line is an economically viable economy relies on value chains that are economically viable. And that means viability for all participants, whether you're a hydrogen producer, mover, or user. But the value chain is complex. And economic viability means different things to different sectors. And risk profiles and, and risk management also varies for different sectors. So what do we need to do? Well, here are two approaches that will help unlock the hydrogen economy in Alberta. Number one is we, we need to improve it economics, ideally and mostly for the end users. We need to reduce the delivered cost of hydrogen for them to help incentivize adoption. Um, number two is we need to enable the connection of value and address the needs and risks across the value chain. Generically, I call this innovation and it can be, you know, by way of example, things like cross-sectoral contracting, uh, risk sharing, developing value propositions and business models that incorporate value created from things like carbon credits, uh, for example, uh, maybe through 
carbon pricing systems or the output based pricing systems or even clean fuel regulations. Scale almost always helps, um, but the decision makers can that can get the system to scale are distributed among and along the value chain. So what does that mean? Well, we have just by way of example, we have 100,000 plus um, class A trucks in Alberta. Um, and they have the potential to consume around 1500 uh, tons per day of hydrogen. And that alone is a two to $3 billion market. But one of the challenges is that there's 20 to 30,000 companies that those trucks are registered to. And that 12 to 1500 tons per day, well, that's two you know, decent sized hydrogen production facilities. So there's a mismatch between the few decision makers of the production facilities and the thousands of decision makers in the transportation sector. And that's just one sector. Um, building heat is a similar story. There's potential in Alberta for around uh, a market size of around 5,000 tons per day. And the electricity sector, which uh, it does have a little more concentration of decision makers, it has the uh, potential of around 5,000 tons per day market, but it is furthest from economically viable. So when we're, we're consulting with industry on these challenges, the number one feedback that we hear from everyone interested in hydrogen, including the producers, is how can we create demand? And a partial answer to this is driving towards economic viability for the end users especially. So one question um, that I would answer when considering investing public tax money into hydrogen is, does it support demand adoption or demand growth by making adoption more economical for the end user? We need to create value. We need to create efficiencies. Um, sometimes we can do this through technology, um, you know, a more efficient widget or a faster something, but often scale and asset utilization are the easiest and cheapest ways to get to economic efficiency and reduce costs. You know, one, one flag that, uh, one thing to flag when it comes to value chain economics is hydrogen is difficult and expensive to move. So there are opportunities to um, act there and, and reduce costs. Importantly, those cost reductions have to trickle down to the end user adopter. And of course, it's not all about economics. There are many non-economic decision-making criteria as well that must be met when considering adopt adopting hydrogen as a fuel. Risk management is a big one. Um, the idea of risk sharing or risk shifting can help. The transportation sector, particularly heavy freight trucking, is widely accepted as being close to economically viable and likely to be an early adopter of hydrogen as a fuel. But um, think about the risks that trucking companies are taking when they're switching their entire vehicle technology platform from one technology, the traditional diesel engines and drivetrains to an, another new technology, a hydrogen fuel cell and battery electric drivetrains. They're faced with operational risks, ensuring fueling and charging stations are available when and where they're needed, logistical risks of changing uh, routes to accommodate the mi a mixed fleet as the fueling infrastructure builds out, um, training, spare parts, mechanics, the list goes on. We're, uh, we're, we're definitely seeing a shift in the landscape on uh, how these risks can be managed. Innovative business models are emerging um, we're seeing OEMs, for example, partnering with uh, supply, the supply side. TC Energy, for example, announced a partnership with uh, truck manufacturers, Hyzon and Nikola. And if you think about that, five, five years ago, that would be a really odd partnership, an energy company partnering with an automotive manufacturer. Like imagine Enbridge or Pemina partnering with Ford or, or GM. So maybe a second question I would answer when considering Invest, considering investing public dollars in hydrogen is does the investment support demand adoption by helping address uh, non-economic factors such as risk and other barriers. So I wanna talk a little bit more about um, ways to reduce costs to make the economics look better. And, and most of the rest of my talk will, will be about ways to do this. I'll start again with transportation. Um, this, chart, this chart shows the uh, per unit energy cost for fuels in Canada. It's an old chart. Uh, many of you have probably seen it before, but it shows that the transportation sector looks more promising um, to be able to make economic sense sooner than other sectors. Hydrogen can be made in the region, uh, the Edmonton region for less than half the wholesale cost of diesel. But we need to look at how to get the hydrogen to the end user and what the costs implications are along the way. So this second chart 
shows the importance of scale. Um, on the left, you can see a small fueling station in the three to 400 kilogram per day range. Um, this adds a tremendous amount of cost to the, the supply of hydrogen. Most of it is, is capital. So as fueling stations scale up, however, two plus tons per day, the cost, um, the cost impacts reduce dramatically. But that's the cost of a fully utilized station. An eight to ton uh, per day station is obviously a lot more capital than a three to four kilogram, three to 400 kilogram per day station. So to get the cost per kilogram down to a tenable level, it must be well utilized. So this next chart shows the effects of utilization. Um, you can see that costs fall dramatically with increasing utilization. And if we overlay on top of that, what is needed, the price range that is needed to make it economically viable for the transportation sector, you could see it's feasible, but the window is tight. Fueling stations need to be built at scale and with de decent utilization. So scale and utilization, well, how can we get to utilization at scale? Well, we need, to, we need fuel use at scale and heavy duty class eight vehicles become a very important leverage point. Our analysis has shown that Canada cannot achieve its legislated commitments to emissions reduction for the transportation sector without a significant shift in fuel use from class eight vehicles. They, they contribute over 50% of uh, medium and heavy duty vehicle emissions. Um, and each class new vehicle, just by example, they are almost six and a half times more emissions than a new class three to seven vehicle, but they're only 12% of new vehicle sales. So there's an opportunity here to get an outsized bang for the buck, so to speak, by investing in class eight vehicle adoption and getting up to scale quickly. Piling onto that, technologies like hydrogen diesel dual fuel offer a low cost, low risk ad adoption pathway for hydrogen as a fuel. The trucks using this technology aren't constrained to a fueling network. Um, and if it runs out of hydrogen, it can still run on diesel to get back to a fueling station. This dramatically reduces the operational risk for carriers and um, lowers that uh, barriers to adoption. Um, also, the dual fuel technology can be applied to new vehicles, retrofitted onto existing ones, um, which would keep asset utilization high. And the technology can even be ported over to other vehicles, other new vehicles, once the original vehicle itself ages out. So this is a way to rapidly grow hydrogen demand and get to that critical scale and utilization needed to reach the tipping point for economic viability. It's important as well to concentrate the demand to the extent possible <clears throat> because this again helps achieve scale quickly by concentrating the demand along existing energy and transportation corridor corridors and coupling them in clusters or hubs to local regional demand in other sectors. This requires um, a degree of collaboration and, and coordination, obviously, um, which is what uh, the hubs are, are, our hub and other hubs are working on doing. Um, currently, we're working towards a north-south corridor between Edmonton and Calgary, anchoring the fuel, fueling supply out of Edmonton uh, in order to leverage that cost advantage. And very quickly, we need to develop a Western Canadian transportation cor corridor and this will really let the hydrogen economy take root and stabilize and start its journey towards the path of, uh, um, of uh, being economically sustainable on its own. But beyond transportation, there are other ways to get to scale as well. And these are complementary ways. Hydrogen blending into regional utility heating systems creates a new uh, a bankable demand that can be used to incentivize and, and make the financing of production and pipeline projects uh, more tenable. And importantly, uh, blending also creates a pathway that opens up the possibility of using pure hydrogen for heating and power generation in the future as those sectors start to decarbonize as well. And we also have large industrial demand in the region that we can piggyback on to get things started, which is a, a, another big advantage we have in the region. But we do recognize that public funding is needed to get things moving. So we should invest in projects strategically. Creating demand should be a top priority, but lowering adoption costs or by lowering adoption costs, um, strengthening the value chains and by addressing, uh, addressing adoption risks. And we could do this by scaling and leveraging multiple sectors. So I wanna wrap up 
um, by showing how these value chains can develop and, and the connections between them. This is, this is where we are today, industrial demand and production of hydrogen um, with some carbon capture, but still some significant emissions. We need to move this quickly towards a low carbon production, um, more carbon capture, uh, for example, um, and other low carbon ways of producing hydrogen <clears throat> and make these and make this uh, hydrogen accessible to end users. Early on, this will probably mean transporting hydrogen by truck or trailer, either as a compressed gas or liquid, um, because this is a quick way to get started. Um, but each of these pathways even has challenges that need to be understood. For example, although liquid hydrogen can, you can, you can transport more um, energy at a time than you can with compressed hydrogen, but the operating costs to liquefy hydrogen is, is higher than for compressing hydrogen. So there's going to be use cases for each, um, each pathway. Um, and also the fueling stations are for each pathway or are, 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 the designs are different. So choosing one way or the other locks in the uh, fueling station design. And of course, there are challenges that need to be overcome in getting OEM equipment into the transportation sector. Right now, the availability of hydrogen equipment, um, trucks, fuel cell vehicles, uh, dual fuel technology is, is low and jurisdictions are competing to attract these companies, um, which have uh, limited, they have limited capacity, so they need to choose their markets carefully. Again, Edmonton and El Alberta, the Edmonton region, um, has a lot of distinct advantages to be able to grow this hydrogen economy quickly. And then ultimately pure hydrogen pipelines um, can be incentivized by a hydrogen blending market, which also may en enable lowering costs at fueling stations and also enables uh, the potential for pure hydrogen heating and power. And then of course, um, there are exports on top of that as a, as a very attractive um, potential end goal for the hydrogen markets. So I'm going to pause there and um, pass it over to Kirk to talk about um, the challenges that that Cifer has uncovered. I'll just Thanks, Mark. Here. Okay, can you see that now, Mark? Yep, looks good. All right, so thank you, Mark. Um, so just sort of picking up where Mark left off, um, the work that we did at CIFR is on behalf of Alberta Innovates, our parent company, to investigate um, the sort of broader challenges over the next three to five years uh, for the, you know, this adoption of hydrogen and transition toward a hydrogen-based economy here in the province. And really also how that connects to the rest of the world and, and compare what we're doing uh, with, uh, with other jurisdictions. So when we talk about the hydrogen value chain and you saw on Mark's slides there, um, you know, the very nice graphic depicting, you know, all of the different things that we have to consider. Uh, for our analysis, we took, we divided it into uh, sort of um, six main or, or five main uh, features. So decarbonized hydrogen production, transmission and storage of the hydrogen, and then the end use. I mean, those are fundamentally the, the domestic um, market aspects that we need to consider. And then there's the export market potential. I mean, certainly that is the long-term goal for Alberta. We want to be able to not just provide hydrogen for Alberta, Albertans and Canadians, but abroad because of the, I guess, the international need or interest in this commodity. And the fact that global economies are, are also decarbonizing and are looking to hydrogen and its derivatives, such as ammonia, uh, to do so uh, as part of their future energy mix. So really what we're looking at here, again, is trying to define those individual sectors and say, okay, it, within the or links within the value chain. And what are the specific challenges in those that we identified in our analysis that sort of help now frame the path forward about, you know, what, what do we need to do in the short term to get started down this path and have some uh, and have a higher degree of success. So when we look at uh, decarbonized hydrogen production. Mark pointed to the fact that yes, right now we are producing a lot of hydrogen in, in Alberta, uh, and very little of that right now, or I wouldn't say I mean, the 
majority of the hydrogen we're producing right now is, is not with carbon capture. We need to switch that over. Um, but even then, the methane-derived hydrogen by means of steam methane reforming or autothermal reforming produces a lot of CO2 that does need to be captured. And current technologies that are in place right now are capturing about 80% of that, that CO2. Autothermal reforming, we're seeing now promises and indications of, of 94, 95, even up, you know, beyond that in terms of their carbon capture, which is excellent. And again, this is you know, very good considering how much CO2 is produced on a mass basis. You're looking bet anywhere between seven and 10 tons of CO2 produced per ton of hydrogen. So again, this has to happen for us to really you know, be using hydrogen as a decarbonized energy carrier uh, compared to natural gas and other fossil fuels. So again, we see promise. We do see limitations though in how much we can do. Uh, in that sense, again, and how quickly we can scale up in, in our production. We do see these systems like Air Products and Suncor also announcing major projects. But again, these, these take years to, to roll out. Uh, so this will limit how much hydrogen we can actually produce and then by, and, and by extension, how much we can use. Another challenge that Alberta faces is that we don't have low cost renewable energy such as hydroelectricity. Even our solar plants are going to be limited in terms of how much we can actually produce and provide you know, large amounts of electricity for hydrogen production by electrolyzers. Another one of the challenges that we face in that regard is that the, where our renewable energies like solar and wind typically are, are more successful in the south, south of the province, we also have water table, um, or I guess water management issues that we need to be very aware of. A lot of agriculture, you've got, you know, two big cities in Lethbridge and Calgary there, and, and everything else that's being used, there's a lot of, uh, and the farming, I mean, there's a lot of uh, water already allocated. So we have to be mindful of that. And then two, the limitations that we have to be aware of in terms of how quickly we can rely on electrification and, and, and for electrolyzers, because again, our grid can only carry so much. And we are, as we see other pressures uh, on the grid, such as again, electrification of you know, electric cars and anything else that we're seeing to go away from, you know, go, go towards decarbonized economies, we have to just be mindful that hydrogen production via electrolyzer is not the only uh, user of, of this new electrical cap capacity. And so the last thing I wanna to touch on again, before I jump to the next slide here is brownfield conversion of the existing hydrogen uh, production that we have. It may not be possible or feasible to convert those to, again, to that blue or decarbonized hydrogen production, whether it be facility cost, aging out those systems, or just we have nowhere, no means to tie in CO2, uh, you know, the, where to put that CO2, and how do we tie it into existing pipeline networks, and, uh, and where, what do we do with it if we actually capture it? So speaking of which, CCUS or carbon capture utilization and storage capacity needs to be expanded to meet our, our future production targets. As noted, between seven and 10 tons of, high, of CO2 are produced per ton of hydrogen. And that's going to, you know, if, if we're looking at forecasts of, you know, up to 20 million tons of methane derived hydrogen produced in Canada, and let's just say the bulk of that in Alberta, uh, by 2040, that could, we could be seeing upwards of 160 million tons of CO2 produced just from hydrogen production alone. And how much of that we're able to capture will be dependent on, again, the carbon capture efficiency of our systems. But a tremendous amount of CO2 is going to be produced by virtue of these systems. So we have to be very mindful of the fact that, you know, it's all well and good, we wanna produce hydrogen, but we're also producing CO2. And what are we going to do with that product? What are we going to do with, you know, where is it going and how are we moving it there? Right now, we have two very successful projects in Alberta, in Shelk West and the ACTL, the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. And their combined capacity is about 16 million tons of CO2 a year, which is great. This is a very large and globally recognized uh, success story. However, again, looking downrange, 18 years from now, if these projections are true, we're going to need 10 times that capacity. And we know how difficult it is and how much time it takes to, you know, roll over everything into you know, new pipelines and, and conversion and everything, we have a lot of work on this front to do. Not even talking about moving hydrogen, it's what are we doing with CO2? And again, like the electrification challenge, CO2 pipelines aren't only gonna be in demand by hydrogen. So we need to be mindful of that. And this, this could be 
a rate limiting step in terms of how much hydrogen we can produce uh, in our province. So again, just keep that in mind when we're looking at where we're putting, you know, when we're saying we want to produce hydrogen, well, we're also producing CO2 if we're doing ATR or SMR uh, derived hydrogen production. We are looking at other means such as pyrolysis, or so we looked at other means like pyrolysis, which do seem to be very attractive in areas, again, we mentioned in the previous slide about where we can't necessarily produce, uh, we have no means to tie into a CO2 uh, transportation network. So that might be a very way, good way of, uh, of producing hydrogen locally. Uh, the only issue now is you are producing a lot of solid carbon black. And so as long as we can find a way to dispose of that safely and effectively, uh, pyrolysis may be an alternative. And again, too, uh, tying back to electrolyzers, they may make sense where we can do it economically and technically. By no means, you know, I'm, I'm agnostic in terms of where, how we make hydrogen. It just needs to make sense. And from right now, our, the most cost effective is still via methane, just given what, how, much, how much of this we have in the province and how good we are at, uh, at working with it. So now that I've spoken a bit about the, the challenges we've associated with production and the, you know, the byproducts, you know, CO2, moving hydrogen around uh, is going to require, right now, again, mark slides we showed, you know, right now, because of the capacity, we're still building those markets. And we're just going to be starting out with probably some fueling stations and some local distribution networks in the Edmonton area. However, as we expand out, as we reach into other communities and start to move large volumes of hydrogen from where it's produced to where it's needed, it's going to need pipeline transportation, much like we do with natural gas and other commodities that we ship around the province. We have hundreds of thousands of kilometers of, of pipelines in the province. So we're very good pipeline engineers here. However, hydrogen is a completely different animal, completely different molecule than anything else that we're shipping right now in large scale over large distances. Yes, there are small scale uh, hydrogen pipelines in the, you know, in the province. They are relatively small though, and they're relatively short, short distance. They are also custom designed. So we have to be very careful about making assumptions about converting legacy pipeline networks over to hydrogen service because of the embrittlement issues you have associated with hydrogen, especially if, it, you know, if, if the hydrogen molecule breaks down into you know, hydrogen ions you can create significant uh, damage just by virtue of the embrittlement effects. And that's just the pipe body. Now we're talking about, you know, we have to consider things such as welds, the heat affected zone around the welds, dents and gouges and other defects and flaws that we might come up, that we know exist in pipelines uh, today. So we have to be very mindful of those impacts and we don't yet understand them fully. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done around the world and some of which here in the province at CIFR and Inatech on this, uh, and we, we are looking at how to, to better understand uh, joint by joint details of material and, and the full scale effects of hydrogen uh, on pipelines and so that we can go back to, to, into industry and say, this is how much hydrogen we think we can handle at pressure. Um, we, you know, th there's a lot of things that we have to address here and a lot of things that, a lot of work that has to be done. So again, be, we have to be very mindful and, of, and careful about not to make too many assumptions about what might be a safe threshold uh, for hydrogen uh, in high pressure uh, conditions. Another thing we need to look to is again, if we have to go and repair welds, uh, repair pipelines, how are we going to do that safely? Can we do in-service welding of hydrogen pipelines? These things have not yet been established. And so we're working again across the country and around the world to come up with methodologies and consistent uh, I guess, criteria to assess viability uh, of various approaches. When we look at pipeline failure risk, again, we need to understand the, the effects of hydrogen on crack initiation and growth of pipeline steels. Again, we're talking about fatigue, uh, sorry, fracture toughness and fatigue crack growth resistance of steels in a hydrogen environment. And we know that those dramatically decrease even at low partial pressures of hydrogen. So we need to, again, understand that. And we need to also accept the fact that our, our Pipeline networks, our gathering systems, our storage systems are not monotonically pressurized. There's a lot of pressure cycling that goes on just by virtue of operation. And there are things that happen that are out of our control too, and movements, ground, you know, ground movements due to frost, heave, and, and whatnot, that we have to accept that there are going to be loads placed on the pipeline that are dynamic and they're always changing. So we need to understand how those are going to impact our crack growth models in the hydrogen environment. We need to understand what happens when, if and when a hydrogen gas line leaks and then what is that ensuing if there's an ignition what does that that jet fire look like and how do we safely manage it 
And then again, this too also scales back to facility risk and how we manage, not just at the refineries and where it's produced, but again, where we're you know, at the city gates and everything else where we are handing off the hydrogen, the high pressure hydrogen to either lower pressure systems or to underground storage. Speaking of which, we talk about hydrogen storage. Again, right now, the short-term goal is, for, okay, let's get some surface tanks in because we can, we're, we're just looking at relatively low volumes of hydrogen as we, you know, that we're producing and using. But as, again, the hub and the demand grows for hydrogen and what we're doing, we have to look at, you know, larger, larger volumes. That's salt caverns. That's really the thing we're looking at now because we, they are proven. We know that salt caverns work. There are about three facilities around the world. I realize it's not a huge number, but there are three that are, are working right now. Um, um, sorry, four, excuse me, four underground, and then uh, three of which are domal, one of which is a bedded salt. And then also, again, how, how can we expand out and learn maybe, you know, can we deploy underground storage in, in aquifers? Can we, can we in depleted reservoirs? Because those are much larger. They don't require washing as you would for a salt cavern. And they're, and they're more readily available around the world. So they're not gonna be so, we're not gonna be so co-located for storage to, to salt deposits. So this again, increases its, its um, the ability to store hydrogen anywhere in the world. So, so we just talked about this here again, this, the storage may require the use of depleted reservoirs, but again, because it's not commercial, we're not sure what, um, you know, how successful we're gonna be in this. We don't know what the response of things like microbial populations, bacteria does tend to feed on hydrogen and produce H2S, which is not the greatest thing to deal with in terms of well integrity and then product quality at the end. And then again, how much we can actually convert, you know, the systems, much like we talk about pipelines, are there the natural gas storage systems that we have in place right now? We might be limited in terms of how many we can actually convert because the, the legacy equipment just may not be sufficient or suitable uh, for, for hydrogen uh, storage. And then lastly, I'll touch on end use here before I start talking about the, the uh, center of excellence and how we, we're gonna be you know, looking to address some of these challenges. Because right now it's still uncertain. Again, we're growing the, the hub, we're starting, we've got, there's a path forward, but we don't yet know how much the heavy industry is going to be adopting hydrogen as a combustion you know, fuel versus post-combustion capture of CO2 um, by means of their own carbon capture systems amine scrubbers and whatnot that they just that would be put on existing systems without having to convert over over their um, their burners and other infrastructure to to accommodate large uh, ratios of hydrogen in their blends or or pure hydrogen on the commercial and residential uh, side atco and others have been doing a lot of work in this space looking at again what are you know how much hydrogen can we introduce before we start to see reliability issues and from my understanding we're seeing you know about 20% is sort of the, the average in terms of where you can, uh, where you, you get you know, absolutely repeatable and virtually no uh, reliability issues. However, different appliances, different systems have, have different tolerances. Some are much greater than that. Some are less than. Uh, work is ongoing, but certainly if we're going to be switching over to pure hydrogen, there's a high probability that we're going to need uh, conversion of new systems and, and those are gonna to need to be certified. And, and again, ultimately that's a cost to the, the consumers. So governments are going to have to come up with rebate and support programs to ensure that us consumers aren't, aren't too out of hand, or too out of pocket rather, excuse me, when it comes to converting over, if our, if our fuel, becomes, fuel source becomes hydrogen. So now that I've laid out um, the, the overarching challenges that we've identified in the report, just quickly run through a path forward that, we, that we're working on in partnership with our parent company, Alberta Innovates, and our, our sister company, uh, Innotech, which we call the Hydrogen Center of Excellence. And really what we're trying to do is help address these technical challenges through this, this center. So the purpose of it is really to, to really close those gaps. Again, we, we just ran through six or seven slides talking about here's the, the big rocks, the big challenges that are in front of us. And as you can see, there's a lot. But this, this, what we've, the, this Hydrogen Center of Excellence has been stood up to really sort of help kickstart some of this innovation and, and really get things moving where there may not be larger pools of money from the province or federal programs or, or others, whether they be from industry or elsewhere, and really help provide that support across the entire value chain to ensure that, you know, development and challenges aren't being addressed in silos, that it's, a, again, we're trying to get things through 
you know, from production all the way to end use and make sure that we're not missing anything just because we're really focused on, on one particular area. As I mentioned off the start there, our partners are, again, Alberta Innovates. They are orchestrating and organizing this. CIFR and Inatech, we are, we are supporting the, the Alberta Innovates through our facilities and, and programming that's gonna be you know, run through there. And then Emissions Reduction Alberta is really the one that are facilitating and doing the call to action uh, as you've seen in their shovel ready projects that they've had in years past. So they, they will also be, they're, they're a fundamental partner in all of this and, they, and they're really the ones that are gonna be coordinating a lot of, a lot of the projects that are, are going to be run. So how does it fit in terms of Alberta's hydrogen ambition? Again, apologize for the, the busyness of this slide, but really there's a, there's, a, there's a goal to have clean hydrogen, clean hydrogen integrated into our energy systems by 2030. And you can see here on, the, on the, the chevrons underneath there, there's seven policy pillars of which the hydrogen center of excellence delivers on sort of the middle five, enabling carbon captures and storage, de-risking investment, uh, activate technology and innovation. That's the, really the central aspect of the, the center of excellence. And then from there, again, ensuring regulatory and efficiency and standards. And then outside or both in, in internal and outside of Alberta is building alliances, connecting with national and international partners to grow uh, the, the, or take advantage of the growth of our hydrogen sector and the knowledge that we're creating, the technology we're, you know, we're, we're, we've developed and share that with the world and also bring in new ideas to Alberta so that again, we can accelerate this in pace and, and, and keep up with, with the other leaders around the world in, in the hydrogen space. In terms of the scope and focus, you look at it from sort of three different tiers. The, the overall ecosystem, we're going to be, you know, looking at opportunity analysis. Where do we, you know, where do we want to focus? You know, the technology development, again, based layered over top of the technical challenges. Keep working with groups like the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub and public awareness, and then that partnership building, both into the internal to the province within industry and other governments, and then also external. So again, how does the how do the national groups, international groups, uh, how do we connect with them to make sure that we are talking and, and working and, and, and sort of feeding off of each other. In terms of technology development, again, it's the, across the entire value chain. So production, transportation, distribution, carrier storage, and end use and markets. So trying to make sure that, again, we're looking at this holistically and, and, and interconnected in an interconnected way. And the services that the Center of Excellence will be providing is, again, testing services, helping stand up pilot facilities, and demonstration projects, and then lastly, again, working with industry and, and standardization and code bodies on those codes and standards and, and the regulators too, so that we have the information that, we are, that is required to make sure that we're doing this consistently, again, across the world with, with whatever's happening across the world and that the regulatory bodies have the information they need so that they can say, yes, we're, we're ready to, to expand this and, and um, consistent with regulatory requirements. So across, if you know, we'll talk about innovation and, and technology development. Well, what does that really mean? If we're talking about, we, we use this term technology readiness level. And there are nine levels of which basically level one is essentially just, you know, sketching it out in your mind and very, very basic con conceptualization and all the way to nine, 10, well, there shouldn't be 10, I don't know why it's there, sorry, level nine is where it's ready to be commercialized or has been commercialized and we're just modifying. So where we're looking at the center of excellence falling in line is sort of between the three and, and the three and seven range. So that's again, where CIFR and Inatech in partnership with Emissions Reduction Alberta and, and uh, Alberta Innovates are going to be, well, this is where we're operating. This is where we're working with industry and technology per, per developers to say, okay, here we see these gaps. How can we help tackle them? What are, what are the technologies we need to, to develop? whether again, whether they be closer to concept or whether they're closer to commercialization, whatever it is, we are, we're going to, you know, that, that's sort of the, the scope that we're trying to aim for. And then over in terms of the funding model and timeline, we're looking at it's a $50 million um, is funding from the government of Alberta, and this will be distributed through Emissions Reduction Alberta. But we're also looking to up, upwards of about $150 million leveraged from other sources like the federal government and, and also industry. Again, we're, we're hoping that, again, the, the federal government hasn't tipped its hand yet as to you know, what matching is going in, but this is what we're seeing is that they, are, they, are, they do see this as important and they do want it to help and support as best they can. So I guess stay tuned. 
Uh, but these are the numbers that were sort of floating around here. And in terms of phase one, again, we've already, you know, phase one was established the governance structure that already happened in the winter. And we had this kickoff uh, here uh, just a few weeks ago. So things are at the end of the hydrogen convention. And so the next step here right now, basically from May onward here is to start implementing the center and getting, getting these systems in place. Everything is still very new. We're still getting all those systems in, in place so that we can start taking on projects and, and engaging with industry to say, okay, what is it that you need? And then from there, uh, hopefully sooner than March, 2023, but again, conservatively March, 2023, start to operate that center. And again, work with ERA, work with others to, to start bringing those projects and support them so that the industry and, and can, uh, and so we can start closing those gaps and, and as, as we expand out the, uh, the hydrogen economy. So that's really a quick level, uh, sorry, quick high level uh, overview of the hydrogen center of excellence. There are, here's some key contacts uh, and these will be available, um, I guess, part of the webinar package. So from the various organizations that are, are associated with the hydrogen center of excellence. And so if you want to ask us any questions in particular that, that you might not be able to during our webinar here, um, please feel free to, uh, to reach out to us and we'd be happy to, to engage and, and answer those questions. So Mark, over back to you. Uh, apologies for running a couple of minutes over. No, that's great. Um, great presentation, Kirk. Thanks. Uh, really appreciate it. So we do have some questions that have been popping up in the in the Q and A, which is great. Um, a few of them are being upvoted, but uh, since I have the mic, I wonder if I could ask maybe a, a few questions for you uh, first, sure. Kirk. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really interesting how Cefer has has done this technology gap analysis. The hub has been working on uh, what are the gaps, challenges, and barriers. In your analysis, and then, and then now we have the, the Hydrogen Center of Excellence set up to address these challenges. Mm -hmm. In your analysis and findings, um, have you found, is there like a, an, an obvious sequencing or strategic order or priority or set of priorities that uh, we should be tackling this, these challenges um, as opposed to sort of trying to boil the ocean so to speak, and um, what is what is the Hydrogen Sec Center of Excellence doing to apply um, that strategic thinking to the hydrogen value chain to ensure that we're getting the most bang for the buck, so to speak? Well, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think, I mean, ultimately, we need to have a market, right? And so that's sort of step one, and that's where your group is, is, in, is working in, in that space. And so fundamentally, if we can start to get that market, you know, and, and start to close those, you know, those smaller gaps. But the bigger, the bigger challenge right now that has to be addressed is again, looking a bit further downrange and saying, okay, when the time comes where we're not just co-locating and you know, the production and use of hydrogen and we need to start moving it somewhere, that, that's the big hurdle. And we see this consistently, not just in Alberta, but around the world, pipeline um, movement of hydrogen. I mean, there's a lot of people that say, oh, we can do it, no problem, again, we're not so sure. We don't have the data to, to say categorically, yes, this is totally fine. There's so much variability in the pipeline materials, the, their service history, welding, damage, all those other things that has to be addressed. The other thing we need to look at is again, how can we, you know, how cost effective can we make it? I mean, if, it, if, if we have to create pipelines out of the most exotic steels just to handle these large volumes of hydrogen, this might limit how much we can actually move around. So we need to, again, that's the big issue, I think, from, from my end. Again, we have other things that we need to look at um, that, that are probably a little further, but you know, that those two are the big ones. And I suppose, too, the other one is, is like I mentioned earlier, is the CO2 uh, sequestration and, and well, just, I guess, transmission uh, capacity. Because I think that's going to be, I mean, right now we still have a lot of capacity that of, of the existing systems, but it is still in the Edmonton sort of central Alberta area. We are going to need to expand that. We're going to need to expand the capacity uh, to make sure that we have enough to build out. And as, so as we are, so basically we're leading, we have sufficient capacity of the CO2 system before hydrogen production comes on demand. So you, you mentioned, um you know, creating market is, is, is key to um, developing a hydrogen economy and growing this whole thing. What, what's the center of excellence doing to support demand creation and market creation? Again, I think it's, it's working with organizations and stakeholders that are, that are 
uh, trying to do the same. And I mean, as I said, I mean, the, the center of excellence just kicked off. So we've just, we've had the initial stakeholder feedback and there are going to be other opportunities and, and forums for industry and stakeholders to, to chime in and say, hey, this is what we're looking for. And so again, this is all still very new. We're all, we're all kind of moving in, in real, in, things are happening in real time here. So I guess in that regard, that's where we want to, you know, engage with people. And say, okay, well, how can we help build demand? What needs? What are the barriers? Are they, uh, are they technical or are they non-technical? I mean, if they are technical, that's where I think the center of excellence really can dive into. The non-technical, I think, is is where we're going to have to work with other stakeholders to say, okay, well, within those non-technical issues, are there are there other issues that that might be cropping up that that are being that barrier for acceptance and uptake? So again, I think it's just this this dialogue that we have to keep having on, on multiple fronts. Yeah, no doubt. Great, great insights. Um, last question for me, and then I, I'm going to look into the mm -hmm. the Q and A. Um, there's some good questions coming in. Um, so you say that the, the center of excellence is open for feedback. What's what's the best way for companies and organizations and individuals to connect in and uh, have that conversation? Well, as I said, right now we're everything's sort of happening in real time. Um, we're looking at ways for, for public, you know, or I guess stakeholder engagement, but probably the best thing right now is to just to reach out to us directly. That's why I put our contact information there. Heather Campbell and David Van Anassam are the, I guess the, the champions. They are the, the center of excellence sort of leads. And the other people in that, on the list here are the individual company uh, liaisons for it. So really that's, that's who, you know, if you want to speak about something technical, you can reach out to CIFR and Inatech. If you want to better understand ERA and, and, and how they are planning on, again, rolling out their, their calls, um, they, they, you know, Mark and Grace would be the people to talk to. And then again, in terms of the overarching governance and, and how this, the, the vision of the, the centers is, would be Heather and, and David. But again, this, we are going to be public, you know, publicizing other events, other opportunities to, to get more buy-in and, 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 and feedback because again this is new we're trying to just figure it out and see it you know it you know and refine it and improve so that this isn't just something that people we want people to use it and we want we want the industry we want stakeholders to use it yeah no that's great this is a really exciting development for sure um you know ever since the the hydrogen roadmap came out there's the little two or three mentions about a hydrogen center of excellence and Ever since then, we've been excited to hear about it. So this yeah. is great. Um, so on to the Q&A um, answers from the audience now. There's a few that have been upvoted and um, I'm, I'm not sure if you wanna to talk to this one or I can talk to this one, but can you provide some comments on the expected benefits of blue low carbon hydrogen pathway in Edmonton against the backdrop, backdrop of the expected low cost global green hydrogen production market? I don't know if you want to address that or yeah. you want me to. Well, I, I'll take a stab at it and then you can join in. I think, again, the advantages that we have right now is that we're already producing hydrogen at scale in the province here, in the, in the region. You know, using, it is methane derived. And yes, most of it is not using carbon capture. But I think, again, the, the, the limitations that I see that it has is again is is really going to be so social. I mean, people already have their backup. Well, you know, it's not it's not no carbon. I mean, at the end of the day, we still have to move the hydrogen, and that's going to have a CO two impact on it as well because it's energy it's energy intensive. And so the, the limitations I see again are going to be based on, on electrical grid capacities. I mean, if we're tying into the the global electrical grid, well, if if you know in certain areas, I mean, there's virtually no renewable energy that's tying into that. So is it really renew is it really green hydrogen production? And then even there, I mean, if it's if you're in other areas where you might have, you know, 60, 70%, well, you still have a CO2 footprint on that electrical uh, generation. But yes. again, it's 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 the same limitation as is going to be how much electricity can we actually um, devote to electric into hydrogen production because it's already been spoken for. I mean it's just like everything else. We can't just assume, oh, we're going to take it. And then because we have to start looking at hydrogen production as part of the overall future energy mix and how energy across all fronts is being used and where realistically the energy to produce hydrogen can come from too. Because as you know, I mean, hydrogen itself is not an energy source, it's an energy carrier. We have to make it from something. 
Yeah, and certainly, certainly in Alberta, we were challenged with our the carbon intensity of our electrical grid, and yes. it's going to be a real challenge for us to get our electrical grid to net zero, let alone yes. any additional uh, load on it for for producing hydrogen. But moreover, there's uh, a bit of a mismatch in where the renewables are available. Um, usually, typically southern Alberta, and where the water is over, uh, water is available to produce hydrogen from in electrolysis. North, in north, yeah, exactly. So that's another challenge. So the way I look at at um, blue hydrogen as well is, again, we like to think of things in terms of pathways. Um, it's blue hydrogen is definitely one of the pathways to net zero, and um, as markets evolve and innovations happen and technologies evolve, green hydrogen turquoise hydrogen pink whatever color of the rainbow of hydrogen you you want to pick will will come on stream now. sort of as applicable right so yeah. blue hydrogen is is an obvious place for us to, to start especially in edmonton because of all the the assets um that we've both talked about so and, and that's a very good point i think it's a starting point right you know we have to be be careful about not getting hung up on you know this is we're going to keep it this way for the next 30 40 years we need to be flexible and we need to we need to look at the evolution of hydrogen like we're looking at the transition toward a hydrogen based economy in that you know we need to go where, where it's going to take us and, and where it makes sense and if that is eventually electrification then so be it but i again i can't speak to that uh i just again we need to i think the best way forward is to have an open mind and, and do it yeah way. and like every conversation about net zero it's it's never an either or debate it's nope. always an and with you know we, yes. we need all the all the technologies and all the solutions and all hands on deck to to yeah. tackle these challenges absolutely um another question in the q a box here um in your observations you're looking at pipeline risks um did you has there been any one looking at utility distribution lines um being that most of them are polymer based yeah. has, have you done any research in that area we are specifically did not. We we looked at the transmission just because of that what hadn't been looked at. Uh, Atco has done a, a lot of work in this space. Again, their their distribution networks. They're they're looking at deploying hydrogen in in Port Saskatchewan in a few months' time, and so they've done a lot of work in this area. And they've concluded that yes, I mean it is a lower pressure system, and it can be the hydrogen risks can be managed uh, safely. And so that is again we they are polymer based. They they. You're going to get hydrogen, some hydrogen leakage out of it. I don't know their specific rates for, for a given design, but from the the literature shows and, and the the research that is that we've seen and what ATCO has demonstrated is that this can be managed safely at those lower pressures. Yeah, and the the one uh, study that I've seen it, it it shows that the leakage rate by energy is uh, equivalent or less for hydrogen than it is for natural gas because yeah. even natural a, gas has a leakage rate through that's a good point no, yeah, that, that's that's a good follow yeah. okay um there's another question in here um and maybe i'll jump on it so how is alberta working or planning to work with their provincial counterparts on an east-west uh corridor to to establish a hydrogen network um so maybe i'll i'll jump in on the or jump in on this one and if you have anything to add kirk feel free yeah. um so there's a lot of activity regina actually just recently announced uh, a foundation study to look at a hydrogen building a hydrogen hub there southeast alberta um is uh currently looking at uh are doing a foundation study as well to look at the potential of, of a hydrogen node there uh the city of calgary as well uh the city uh, or not the city but the, the province of bc has formed their clean innovation or clean energy innovation center of excellence or something like that sorry at cice um and there's also activity in winnipeg and uh sarnia there's so there's a lot of talks about hydrogen one of the things that that we're doing is looking at um, this corridor and trying to organize how can we build this into a larger um more coordinated type of uh not organization but at least a network where we get these hydrogen hubs talking to each other sharing information um you know planning joint uh coordinated projects things like that so that we, ha we have a person actually dedicated on 
exact, doing exactly that, building a, a network of, of hydrogen hubs in uh, Western Canada and linking to them together along energy cor corridors so that we can unlock an entire um, east-west energy system. So I don't know, Kirk, do you have anything to, else to add on? No, I, I think, I think you, you've nailed it. I mean, the other thing too, from an industry side, you look at the projects that are going on like Enbridge has in, in Markham and then also in Quebec. Um, there's some pretty exciting stuff that's happening. And I think it's important for us uh, from the center of excellence side and also from you know, the hub side to, to just be aware of what's happening and to, and to promote them too. Again, a part, of, part of the organic growth is just making people aware that, hey, we're also doing this. And it's not just a wacky Edmonton idea because our, our winter nights are too long. You know, like <laughs> we, 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 have, uh, we have solidarity in, in, other, in other parts of the country and around the world. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. There's one here, an interesting one about um, pipelines. It says, um, do you think we, we do ourselves a disservice by talking about uh, hydrogen pipelines, especially using our existing aging carbon steel infrastructure um, when public sentiment in pipelines is not positive? So I, I find that in, that's, that's quite an interesting question about yeah. how we frame the pipeline conversation. I think that's that is it's a very good question. I mean, to me, the the importance of addressing the legacy pipeline question isn't to say, "Hey, it's green light, we're ready to go." It's rather to actually to limit the amount of expectation we have for it. Um, realistically, I mean, and and this is just you know we have a lot of work in front of us. And just to to the question, the person who asked the question's point again, it's an aging network. There are going to be sections that just won't be suitable. That said, there might be sections that with some modification, either through a liner coatings we're looking at, um, that we might be able to, to move hydrogen as a stopgap until the new hydrogen dedicated pipelines are, are, are manufactured. But building on, on again, the, the, the question, it's a very socially sensitive topic. Um, for whatever reason, it is it, pipeline is just essentially two four-letter words smashed together in, in Canada, and, and we just can't seem to to get consensus on on their importance. And so we have to be sure. Yes, it's a, it's as much of a social challenge in terms of demonstrating the safety of hydrogen transport uh, as it is a technical one. Because if we get it wrong, yeah, we, we there's no chance if you know that the society as a large is going to, as a whole is going is going to allow us to to move with pipelines if we if we're careless and, and have uh, mistakes uh, from the bit from the beginning. And Heather Heather Campbell has a, a great uh, comment here in the chat. Thanks, Heather, for that. Um, she, she says, "Is it about what's in the is it is it about what's in the pipeline versus, or is it about the pipeline?" So I think that's a, a really good conversation that we need to. It is, and, and I mean. Have. I, I think I think that there is certainly groups that are are very much about what's in the pipeline, but there are probably as many groups that are just you know moratorium on any pipeline, just because their trust in in the energy industry is is so low. Um, again, not my my scope, so I'll, I'll, care, I'll carefully tiptoe back from that that edge. But uh, no, I think that's uh, that's a major important uh, aspect of this, and I think. Another plank, uh, again, why it's important to have really uh, engaged stakeholders that are not just technical in, in, in nature. We need to have those other stakeholders from the social uh, sides, from all groups, from, from society, from First Nations, from whomever to, to speak about this because it's, it's, an important, uh, it's important to have those conversations so that everyone feels heard and that everybody understands what's going on. Great. So we uh, are out of time. So I'd like to thank everybody for their precious, precious time and attention. Um, this webinar will be available on our website, erh2.ca. Um, in a, about a few weeks, we'll post the slides and uh, recording of the webinar. So thanks everybody for your time. Sorry that we didn't get to everybody's questions. There were just so many and they were all excellent questions, but yeah, and, and happy to answer those questions. You say my contact information is there. If there's ones of technical nature, happy to keep the conversation going. So. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you.